Good morning, my fellow Minnesotans. Please be seated. I welcome all of you to this historic inaugural cer ceremony, and I would like to begin by naming some of our state's leaders who also join you in the celebration, starting with U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar and our distinguished members. <laughs> Distinguished members of Congress, Betty McCollum and Angie Craig. <laughs> Governor Mark Dayton. Go Fishback. <laughs> Governor Al Qui. Seated. Thank you to all our educators. I know that as a young parent many years ago, that I always said that in addition to wanting my children to be safe, I really wanted two things for my kids, good health care and great teachers. Thank you, educators, for all that you've done for uh, all of us. standing after that for the presentation, um, for the invocation and for the singing of the Star Spangled Banner and the drum performance. Forward, march. Thank, Thank you. you. Now I'd like to invite you to welcome with me Rabbi Marsha Zimmerman, Senior Rabbi from Temple Israel in Minneapolis, and then Ayman Assad Zamin, Executive Director of the Muslim American Society of Minnesota. A second century rabbi once said, Rabbi Hanina Mitpalel Shel Malchut, pray for the welfare of the government. If they could do that in the second century, I think we can do that in the 21st century. And so we are poised for a new beginning in this great state of Minnesota. We pray for the welfare of our state and our government. One Minnesota a vision of oneness to realize these aims. Where there is ignorance, 
Let there be educators who are respected and well paid. <laughs> it's my only political statement. I have a daughter who's a teacher. <laughs> Where there is prejudice and hatred, let there be acceptance and love. Where there is fear and suspicion, let there be openness and trust. Where there is oppression, let there be justice. Where there is poverty and disease, let there be prosperity and health. Where there is strife and discord, let there be harmony and peace. Where there is no ability for access, let us be bridge builders opening the front door. And for these newly elected and re-elected public servants, may you find patience to tolerate frustration without experiencing anxiety or tension. May you be able to carry the load and responsibility with discernment and wise judgment. May you stay calm and balanced even when facing difficulties and challenges. May your friends and family especially not be taken for granted. They come first. And may we, as family of elected officials, make sure that we continue with our passions and our strength while they're busy working those hours that they do. Baruch atabavo echa. Blessed are you as you begin your journey. Uvaruch et atabetzetecha. And blessed will you be as you go forth into the hours, days, weeks, and years ahead, that you will create a vision where we will look back and we will look forward and affirm we are one Minnesota. Amen. Thank God this team is finally going to be in charge. <laughs> the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Sayyidul Qawm Khadimuhum, the leaders of a people are their servants. I congratulate you for stepping forward to serve the people of Minnesota, and I remind you of the trust you have chosen to undertake. God Almighty, Allah says in the Quran, God commands justice and excellence in generosity. Dear constitutional officers, you are now or you're soon to be in charge. The people of Minnesota have entrusted you their hopes and aspirations for social justice and well-being. We look to you to build upon the past successes of our great state we remind you of the many structural injustices that need to be addressed so justice can be brought forth. Please join me in a short invocation. God Almighty, you have created us and you have created our beautiful state. You have seen fit to appoint to office these constitutional officers. So therefore, guide them with your wisdom. Endow their hearts with compassion for, for all our people. Empower them with courage to render social justice to all our people. Make it easy for them to, do, to help our people and make it hard for them to hurt our people. Cover them and all of us in your mercy this day and every day. These we ask you in all your good names. Amin. Please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Minnesota's own, the great Robert Robinson, accompanied by Mr. Sam Reeves on piano.
the dawn's early light What so proudly we hailed At the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the pale Please remain standing, but thank you so much for that beautiful, beautiful rendition, Mr. Robinson and Mr. Reeves. We will now hear from the Iron Boy singers who will perform a flag song. This song honors the flags that represent us, our veterans of our nations, all of us.
please be seated. We will now begin the swearing in of our constitutional officers, beginning with Attorney General elect Ellison, who will be sworn in today by U.S. District Court Judge Michael Davis. Place your hand on the Bible, uh, the Quran. Raise your right hand. <laughs> Do you, Keith Maurice Ellison, solemnly swear to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, and to discharge faithfully your duties as Attorney General to the best of your judgment and ability? So help you God. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Judge Davis. Thank you, friends. Thank you, family. Let me tell you about Alex Smith. He worked hard as a restaurant manager. He had a dream of owning his own restaurant one day. He was loved by his family and his friends. Last year, when Alex turned 26, he aged out of his mother's health care insurance. And he couldn't afford insurance of his own on a salary of $35,000 a year. His insulin alone cost him $1,300 a month. Alex had to ration the insulin that was saving his life. And Alex couldn't ration the way he wanted to, and he died a month later. Alex couldn't afford his life, and he's not alone. The price of insulin has gone up 1,200% in 20 years, and this has enhanced the profits of big companies that make the product, but threaten the lives of 1.25 million Americans who live with type 1 diabetes every day, especially communities of color. My job as the people's lawyer is to help Minnesotans like Alex afford their lives with dignity and respect. In this time of some of the worst income inequality our country has ever seen, our bastion, of bull, our bulwark for protecting democracy is in our law and is in our Attorney General's office. The demands of profit over people are putting pressure on our democracy. And as the people's lawyer, the Minnesota Attorney General's office will be the place, as it has been from Walter Mondale to Lori Swanson, right over there, give her a hand please. where we protect the rights of people. Isn't that right, Lori? 
Minnesotans deserve an attorney general's office where they can count on fair treatment and equal justice. And they won't just come to us, we will go to them. There is no town, no county too small or too far away from the metro that my office will not do everything it can to help. We will be all over Minnesota listening to you, fighting for you. The Minnesota Attorney General's Office will be the place where everybody counts and everybody matters. That's what it looks like to help Minnesotans afford their lives and give dignity and respect to all. Protecting people who, uh, is hard work. Protecting our democracy is even harder work. What makes the work easy, though, is Minnesotans already know how to help each other and afford their lives and live with dignity and respect. And because we do it every day, it's who we are. I want to thank Minnesotans for allowing me to serve as their people's lawyer. I want to thank my mother, Clyde Ellison, who's here today, and all of my family. All of my family and all of my friends. I want to thank Monica Hurtado for standing with me through thick and thin. And I want to thank Kim Ellison for standing with me too for 20 years. And I want to thank all of you and all of my friends, all my family, all my children. I want to thank you to all my fellow Minnesotans and everyone all across the United States, no matter how you voted or even if you voted, you count and you matter and I'm on your side. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Attorney General Ellison. Thank you. Next to be sworn in is our Secretary of State, Steve Simon, and he will be sworn He'll be sworn in by Minnesota Supreme Court Chief Justice Lori Gilday. Simon, swear or affirm to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Minnesota and to discharge faithfully your duties as Secretary of State to the best of your judgment and ability, so help you God. I do. Congratulations, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you and good morning. As I'm sworn in for a second term as Minnesota Secretary of State, I can't help but think about a letter that I discovered during my first term as Secretary of State. The letter is from 1965. A Minnesota member of Congress wrote it to a resident to explain his support of the Voting Rights Act, which passed in that year of 1965 and opened the door for voting for millions of Americans. The letter was pretty standard except for the end. At the end, he finished with this. He wrote, I will remain restless until democracy is real for everyone. Restless. I love that word. It's perfect. And he was right. When it comes to our democracy, we cannot sit still. We should be restless about our democracy, especially today in 2019, when foreign governments target our election systems, and when, despite our number one ranking in the country in voter turnout, despite that, despite that, yes, we are proud of it and never get tired of mentioning it, but <laughs> at least I don't. 
Uh, but despite all of that, despite that ranking, though, there are hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans every election, year in and year out, who don't vote or can't vote. The good news is that we are restless in Minnesota. We have an urge to keep moving, to keep improving, because we know we can. People on the outside looking in, they sometimes tease us a little bit in Minnesota, and they say that we are passive aggressive as Minnesotans. <laughs> You've heard it. But when it comes to our democracy right now, right here in 2019, Minnesotans want a little less passive and a little more aggressive. <clears throat> They want to make it easier for every voter to vote. They want to get even more people across all communities to actually use that vote. And they want to make our elections even more secure and trustworthy. Now, part of that, part of that means passing new laws, reforms like automatic voter registration, election security protections, or restoring the right to vote for those who have left prison behind. But there is more work to do. We have a lot of people in our state, you know this, we have a lot of people in our state who are fed up with politics. They don't want to vote. They don't care to vote. They don't think their vote will ever even matter. Reaching out to them will take a lot of hard work and a lot of patience. And you know what? That is exactly what we are going to do. I look around this room today and I have faith. I feel faith in our democracy, but I am still restless because we do have more work to do across party lines, across county lines, across color lines, to make democracy real for everyone. We need to do that work now, together, as one Minnesota, and above all, we need to stay restless. I thank you for the honor and opportunity to work with all of you for another four years. I wanna thank friends and family. It's actually my wedding anniversary today, so. So special hats off to my wife, Leah, for putting up with so much, and it's truly an honor to serve. Thank you so much. Yay. Congratulations, Mr. Secretary. The next official to be sworn in today is Auditor-Elect Julie Blaha, who will be sworn in by Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Paul Thiessen. <laughs> Do you, Julie Blaha, solemnly swear to support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of our state of Minnesota, and to discharge faithfully your duties as state auditor to the best of your judgment and ability, so help you God. I do. Congratulations. So excited to be here. This is the first time I've had the chance to attend, and uh, as uh, Lieutenant Governor Elect Peggy said, we got really great seats uh, for this. But I want to talk about where I'm sitting. Uh, you know, it's always good to know where you stand, maybe now more than ever. It can be hard to find solid ground uh, when facts come with alternatives, there are nonstop attacks on truth tellers, and no matter what crazy thing you think about government, a blogger somewhere will confirm it. Now, it's enough to make anyone dizzy, especially those hundreds of Minnesotans being sworn in this week in county seats, city halls, and township meeting rooms all over the state. Now, the amazing team at the Office of the State Auditor is here to help. 
I've spent the past few weeks digging through spreadsheets and analyzing financial reports and ripping into budgets. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> and I promise we will be ready to give the public officials the data and the analysis they need to know where they stand as they do the public's business. We will be there for the public as an unbiased and thorough auditor of $20 billion in taxpayer money spent at the local level every year. Now, our, offer, our office may give its seal of approval, it may find a problem, but I'll tell you this, you will be able to trust our work. You will know where you stand. Now, this is an important job, and I am deeply honored and humbled to lead this amazing team of professionals. I want to thank my family and my friends, everyone who helped us get here, and it was every single one of you. Thank you. And I also want to know where uh, everyone in Minnesota to know where they stand with me. I, too, believe that we are one Minnesota, and I want everyone across Minnesota to know that they stand with us as a partner. We will be your partner, me and the entire state auditor's office. And early in my journey toward this office, uh, I shared a memory of my mother. These are her pearls. Uh, many years ago, she won a seat on the Burns Township Road and Bridge Committee so she could pave some roads. Now, with her neighbors and good data and a lot of help from my dad, uh, she found a way to make her vision real. Now, that humble act settled the dust so more grandpas could sit outside on the porch and more of my friends could ride bikes in the summer. That is the sort of local-sized, life-changing project a committed state auditor can encourage. So when you are ready to put your dream out there, the office of the state auditor is ready to help you make it real. I am humbled that Minnesota has trusted me with this important role, and I will work every day to be the auditor Minnesotans deserve. Thank you. Let's go. Congratulations to you, Auditor Blaha. Our next participants, the Minneapolis Youth Chorus, will perform a very special piece of music. The chorus consists of Minneapolis public school students, grades 6 through 10. Under the direction of Patrice Arisim and accompanied by Walter Tambour, they will perform Old Colored Earth, an original song written by Minnesota composer Steve Heitzig. Still remain seated.
Thank you, Minneapolis Youth Choir. That was absolutely beautiful. We now move to the oaths of office for Lieutenant Governor and Governor. Lieutenant Governor-elect Peggy Flanagan made history on November 7th by becoming the highest ranking Native woman ever elected to executive office. ranking Native woman ever elected to executive office in our country, and she will be sworn in today by Minnesota Associate Justice Ann McCaig, who also made history in our country by being appointed by Governor Dayton as the first Native American to serve on a state Supreme Court in this country. Flanagan, put your hand on the Bible and please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Minnesota and to discharge faithfully your duties as Lieutenant Governor to the best of your judgment and ability, so help you God? I do. <laughs> Thank you, Minnesota. Chi Mi Gwet. When I ran for the state legislature, I fell in love with my district. When running for lieutenant governor, I fell deeper in love with the state of Minnesota. This is an indescribable and humbling honor, and I will serve you every day to the best of my ability. Thank you to my Anishinaabe sister, Justice McKegg. You made history as the first Native woman appointed to the Minnesota Supreme Court, and I'm honored to have you swear me in today as I become the highest ranking Native American woman elected to ele executive office in the country. And I never imagined that I would say that. <laughs> My story is a one Minnesota story. It's about community. My mom lives in Plymouth. My dad lives on the White Earth Reservation. Along with my incredible partner, Tom, they are all here today. My mom moved us to the community of St. Louis Park so that I would have access to good schools, stable neighborhoods, and the opportunity to thrive. We didn't have much growing up, and what little we had, she used to make sure that we got ahead. Thank you, Mom. But it didn't always add up, and we needed help. 
I was that kid with a different colored lunch ticket. We needed those free meals at school. Medicaid saved my life. As a kid with asthma, it's the reason that I'm alive today. Growing up wasn't easy, but it made me strong. I stand before you today because of a loving family, a supportive community, and a great state. My vocation is to create community across Minnesota, a community like mine that lifts people up and provides them with a little help when they need it. My story is a one Minnesota story. It's about pathways. I am where I am today because of people who believed in me. My parents, my teachers, my speech coach, my college professors, and I'm here because of the late Senator Paul Wellstone. I'm here because of the late Senator Paul Wellstone, whose last campaign was my first. Their belief in me made it possible for me to believe in myself. Their support created pathways, pathways paved by Minnesota values that allowed me to get a high quality education, seize opportunities, attend a public university, to be elected to the state legislature, and now become the Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota. My mission is to help create pathways for every Minnesotan, whether they live with a single mom in Section 8 housing, they're a farm kid struggling to figure out whether they can stay on the land that they love, or an iron, iron ranger who lost her job in the mine and is desperately searching for another way to support her family. As your Lieutenant Governor, I will never lose touch of how it felt to reach into my sneaker in the lunch line to take out that ticket. And I promise you that I will do everything I can to ensure every Minnesotan sees a path to a brighter future. My, my story is a one Minnesota story. It's about trying new things. Governor Walls and I, that feels really good. Uh, Governor <laughs> Walls and I <laughs> did something different. We ran as a team from early on. And if you haven't already gathered, uh, we are and have been sincere good friends with a profound respect for one another. We will build... <laughs> We will build on the legacy forged by Lieutenant Governor and now Senator Tina Smith. We will reshape the role of Lieutenant Governor in Minnesota and we will govern in partnership. By elevating the role's significance, we will bring diverse perspectives to the governor's office. Tim Walls chose me as a governing partner because he believes in creating space for new voices. I'm proud to open the door and now my job is to hold that door wide open for others. My story is a one Minnesota story. It's filled with contradictions. A few moments ago, I was sworn in on a Bible from 1854. It's written in the Ojibwe language. My thanks to the Minnesota Historical Society for making it available today. I chose this Bible because it has deep spiritual meaning to me as a Catholic. But this Bible was also a tool used to erase Native people's culture and tradition. These contradictions are present throughout our history. I stand before you now as a leader of an executive office in Minnesota an office that oversaw horrific treatment of my ancestors. An office whose governor once declared that our Dakota brothers and sisters, and I quote, must be exterminated or driven forever beyond the borders of Minnesota. And yet, this is the same office, thanks to Governor Mark Dayton's actions in 2012, that repudiated those hateful words and actions of a previous administration. Thank you, Governor Dayton.
and I am happy that Dakota people are still here. <laughs> my people talk about walking in two worlds, but one of my most treasured mentors encouraged me to reject that idea. I am an Ojibwe woman, and I am an Ojibwe woman all the time. I have a responsibility, especially because of those who came before me and cleared a path, to do good for my people all the time. I am an Ojibwe woman. I am a mother. I am a Minnesotan. This is a lens through which I see my world and the lens through which I will do my work as Lieutenant Governor. That Ojibwe Bible is complicated. Our history is complicated. Our state is complicated. The issues facing us are complicated. Try as we might, they can't be whittled down to a hashtag. They need nuance. They need to be faced with the experiences of all Minnesotans, especially those who aren't present when decisions are made that affect them. That is how Governor Walls and I will greet those complicated and nuanced challenges. Our past informs who we are, but we build our future together. My story is a one Minnesota story. It looks to the future. I have a five-year-old daughter. She's here today. <laughs> Her name is Siobhan. She is funny, energetic, opinionated, and a leader. She's my little Anishinaabe Kwe. She recently lost her first tooth. <laughs> and attended her first Native American affinity group meeting at school. My job is to show young people like her what is possible. To all young indigenous people, young people of color, young people in rural communities who feel forgotten, you deserve to be seen, heard, and valued. There is a place for you in this work. Your own story and experiences are valid. You deserve to have a voice within your own community and within your own future. Our future is bright. One Minnesota is grounded in the fact that people directly affected by decisions have a seat at the table. The future of our state depends on people being engaged in their government. One Minnesota does not mean that we're all the same. One Minnesota means that we work together across lines of difference to find our shared values and improve people's lives. So, let's get to work. Chimi Gwetch. Thank you so much for this incredible honor. Our very best wishes and congratulations, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan. As a husband, a father, a teacher, a coach, military veteran, and six-term U.S. Representative for Minnesota's first congressional district, Governor-elect Tim Walls embodies his vision of one Minnesota through servant leadership, inclusivity, and a deep commitment to public service that improves people's lives. 
Governor-elect, please come forward to have the oath administered by Chief Justice Lori Gilday. Tim Walls solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, and that you will discharge faithfully your duties as governor to the best of your judgment and ability. So help you God. I do. Congratulations, sir. to be a teacher to remember the nieces and nephews' names. So a lot of them, so. As a small town kid turned soldier, football coach, teacher, husband, and dad, never did I envision before you, uh, before that I would be here and standing as your Minnesota's 41st governor. Um, I know and neither did you believe that. So, um, <laughs> but thank you all for being here. This inaugural ceremony is a public acceptance of our legal and moral responsibility to this great state, a clear recognition of the privilege that we've been given by the people of Minnesota to do our very best to further our state's magnificent legacy. To those of you who voted for me, thank you for your trust. For the Minnesotans who voted for someone else, like a gentleman I met on a cold Friday night last month at a listening session in Fergus Falls, who came up and told me, I didn't vote for you, Tim, and I don't agree with a lot of your positions, but I don't want you to fail. What can I do to help? To that gentleman. To that gentleman and all Minnesotans, I'll work hard to earn your trust and be your governor too. Thank you to Chief Justice Gilday and to our judicial branch for the work you do. And thank you to our constitutional officers. It is an absolute honor to stand here with all of you. So thank you. And to Lieutenant Governor, oh, that is wonderful. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your friendship. And thank you for making Minnesota proud. Chi miigwech. <laughs> to Senator Klobuchar, Congresswoman McCullum, Congressman Nolan, Congressman Maloney from New York, and this is fun to say now, Congresswoman Craig. Um, <laughs> Those of you of a certain age, don't tell me you're not thinking The Muppet Show in any way here, so. 
<laughs> to our Minnesota legislators, uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you for your service to the people of Minnesota. I honor those election certificates you worked so hard to earn. And as a former legislator, I understand very clearly what the term co-equal branches of government means. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Governor Dayton. I believe that when history tells Mark's story, his lasting legacy will be that he put people first, always, above politics, before himself. Because of that, he clearly left us a better Minnesota, and we are in your debt. A thank you to my wife, Gwen, Minnesota's First Lady. <laughs> Minnesota's First Lady, but she's my best friend and true partner. She's the one who makes everything possible, so thank you, Gwen. I love you dearly. Um, to the light of my life, my wonderful kids, Hope and Gus, thank you for all of you doing your patience. Gus made sure this line was in there. Yes, the puppy's coming. Puppy's coming. So, uh, <laughs> to the rest of what you saw, my incredible, uh, my incredible extended family, um, especially thank you to, uh, to my sister-in-law, Julie Walls, and her children, Jake and Avery. Um, your dad would be proud of you, and uh, I am. So thank you for that. To, uh, All that family. A, a special thank you to my, uh, my incredible uh, father and mother-in-law, Val and Lynn Whipple, um, for the work that they do. So, you all know that old saying, behind every governor is an astonished mother-in-law. So Lynn, thank you for that. So. <laughs> and Lynn, mom, mother, Vera is here too, and I think for all of us to understand and, and listen to the incredible legacy of this state, uh, Vera was born in the year that women acquired the right to vote, and so it's wonderful to have her here. To be here. And to my mom, Darlene Walls, thank you, mom, for everything you've done. Thank you especially for showing me what real strength looks like. I love you. And to those of you who walked in this theater with me, teachers of mine, teachers I worked with, students I've taught, and all of the educators in this room, please stand up as we say thank you to you. Thirty-six years ago to the day, Governor Rudy Perpich also asked the teachers in the room to rise during his swearing-in ceremony at Hibbing High School. I'm honored to recognize educators again today. Thank you. We find ourselves at a time when economic, social, racial, and geographic division feels rampant. I will not normalize behavior that seeks to deepen or exploit these divides. I will not normalize policies that are not normal, ones that undermine our decency and respect. If Washington won't lead, Minnesota will. There's a temptation to see these times as unprecedented, to see our current challenges as insurmountable. As a history teacher, I found it instructive to look back at past inaugural speeches to see how other incoming governors portrayed the situations facing them. In 1955, Governor Orville Freeman painted a picture of a society in intense crisis, besieged by the struggle between freedom and totalitarianism that was raging around the world. In 1971, 
Governor Wendy Anderson spoke about how health care costs were too much or not even available to some. He described a housing shortage in which the average young couple in Minnesota couldn't ever dream of buying a home. And in 1979, Governor Al Quie expressed concern about discrimination in our state. Governor Quie urged the legislature to take action to eliminate discrimination in all forms and to open opportunities for women, people of color, the poor, those with disability, and the elderly. Governor Quie is with us today. And in 2011, Governor Mark Dayton described how education system was failing our students and thus failing our future. It strengthens my resolve to know that those who came before me, on whose shoulders I stand, face difficult challenges, many similar to those we face today. My predecessors tackled those problems they faced, and working together with the legislature, they made progress. Because of that progress, our state enjoys one of the best education systems in the country, one of the best health care systems in the country, and perhaps the best quality of life in the country. But we can and must do more. Old ways of doing things must be updated. New solutions must be found for new problems. We must continue to aim higher, reach further, and build brighter futures for all people of this great state. Foundational to our past, present, and future is the quality of our people and that all begins with education. Every student in Minnesota deserves the opportunity to learn in the best schools in the country with caring, qualified teachers. But as I traveled around this state, I see how the quality of a student's education is often far too dependent on their race or their zip code. A few weeks ago, I met a grandmother who lives with deep anxiety. Her fear is that her grandchild living in Cre La Crescent won't receive the same opportunities or have as bright a future as her grandchild in Woodbury because of inequities in education. Disparities in our educational system based on geography, race, or economic status hold back not only our students, but our entire state from reaching its full potential. That's why we must dedicate ourselves now that we must make Ed Minnesota the education state for all children black, white, brown, indigenous. That starts with our shared values, the values we hold in common for the common good. Our state has a proud tradition of valuing the power of education. We must recommit ourselves to this Minnesota value. If we are going to foster the best education system in the country, every politician, every community, and every Minnesotan must value our children receiving the highest quality of education we can give them. This means starting by valuing teachers, by valuing our principals, by valuing our mentors, by valuing our paraprofessionals, by valuing our bus drivers, and of course, by valuing every single student. In sum, it means valuing the greatest of American institutions, public education. Minnesota, let's recognize those simple truths. Education is the great equalizer of our society. Education unleashes untapped potential. Education conjures the magic of a promising beginnings and the grace of second chances. Putting a young child on a yellow bus to pre-kindergarten in St. Cloud prevents that same child later in life from riding a bus to prison in Stillwater. Some of these truths are inspiring, others are uncomfortable but they all lead us back to one of our core beliefs as Minnesotans, that every single child deserves and will get that quality education. Today, we also reaffirm our Minnesota value that healthcare is a basic human right.
I have to tell you, though, what Minnesotans want from health care is pretty simple. First of all, they don't want to get sick. <laughs> Secondly, if they do, they want to get quality health care that doesn't break the bank for them. For far too many, that simple request is not easy. As Minnesotans, we can figure out how to deliver health care more effectively, more affordably, and with better results. We can and must ensure that every Minnesotan has access to high quality and affordable health care. But it won't stop there of just getting our folks health care. We will invest in our cutting edge research institution and partner with our state's health care industry to ensure that the cure for the world's most devastating diseases come right through Minnesota. This past year, I was given the incredible privilege of crisscrossing our entire state, visiting hundreds of communities. What became absolutely and abundantly clear is that prosperity and opportunity for all people in all parts of our state stems from the well-being of those individual communities. We must ensure that communities across Minnesota aren't just surviving, but they're thriving. We must ensure equity in everything we do from addressing the absolutely unacceptable racial disparities in our state to ensuring that opportunity is not determined by your zip code. Right now, whether you're from the urban east side of St. Paul or a rural town of Medelia in southern Minnesota, many young people are leaving their communities because they don't see a future or an opportunity in them. Many times they leave, but like so many of us, they feel the tug on their heartstrings to get close to home. They want to be near family, and they want to contribute to the community that raised them. These are exactly the people that we want back in their Minnesota communities, yet they have to overcome great barriers to do so. Just a few weeks ago, a young mother in Halleck told me that she almost gave up on her effort to move back home after struggling for months to find affordable housing and child care. Those were the two things stopping her from reaching that dream to going back to that wonderful community that she was raised. Investing in infrastructure, increasing access to quality housing, expanding options for affordable child care, protecting the right to collectively bargain for a pathway to the middle class. <laughs> and giving the local leaders the tools they need to succeed. It will take meaningful, sustained action to foster vibrant communities across Minnesota where families want to settle down and raise their children. And we will do this work through the lens of one Minnesota because we all know if Mankato thrives, Moorhead thrives. And if Rondo thrives, the range thrives. There's no doubt about it. We face some tremendous challenges in coming years. I'm not Pollyannish. Those of you who know me in here, I'm an optimist, but I also supervised the lunchroom for 20 years, so I'm a realist. <laughs> we know these things are out there, but we don't look towards them with fear. Our economy is changing. Healthcare costs are still soaring. Even our climate is unstable, causing devastating weather events. But we must face these challenges with the quiet confidence that can only be found in Minnesota, with bipartisan pragmatism and a humble determination to lead in the bold North. When our state has faced equally big challenges in the past, we've always met them with a unique, innovative spirit that allowed us to not only fix the problems, but to lead the nation. We must again find opportunities in these challenges Instead of burying our head in the sand when it comes to climate change or to providing affordable quality health care or housing and good paying jobs, we must take them head on. But we can only do this if we come together. We've done it before. One Minnesota is not something new. In 1955, in that inaugural address, Governor Orville Freeman implored Minnesotans to pray for the courage, energy, and wisdom to meet together the great challenges of our times. He said, working together, Minnesota cannot fail. In 1983, Governor Rudy Perpich said, we are one people in Minnesota, not a people divided by regions or speech patterns. In 2003, Governor Tim Pawlenty spoke of the Minnesota way defined by our beautiful, bountiful land, our incredible people, and a tremendous spirit of innovation. 
And in 2011, Governor Mark Dayton said, our differences cannot be permitted to blind us to the larger truth that we are one Minnesota. As many of you know, and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan will tell you, if you know me for five minutes, I will talk to you about high school football coaching. Um, <laughs> I did it for many years. I have a high regard for what competition can bring on the football field. But governing is not a sporting contest, with opposing teams each wanting to defeat the other. It's not a horse race nor a poker game to see who can best beat the other. It's about working together finding common solutions to improve people's lives. It's not sport, it's governance and democracy, and when we come together, we can tackle these problems. <laughs> there is unity in our traditions, our ancestors, from the original Anishinaabe and Dakota people, the first people, you honor us with your presence. And those that came after, the immigrant farmers, they carved out a way of life in this unforgiving cold. I've seen our ability to pull together firsthand as a soldier in the Minnesota National Guard. Time and again, as I was deployed to areas where families worked together to rebuild their communities, devastated by flood, tornado, or fire. One Minnesota's in our blood. It is born of our shared values. It's sewn into the fabrics of our communities. It is driven by the collective good and fueled by our innovation. No matter how daunting the challenge, no matter how dark the times, Minnesotans have always risen up by coming together. Our blood saved the Union at Gettysburg. Our iron forged the tanks that liberated Europe. Our farmers sparked the Green Revolution that fed the world, and our imagination transformed medicine. One Minnesota is who we are. We need to foster it together because this is a state, and no matter what the times or the challenges from all of the past coming down to the responsibility that falls on us today is, this is not a state that fears the future, we create the future. Let's get creating, Minnesota. Thank you. personal and our collective congratulations. Thank you all for your very inspirational remarks today. The next four years are sure to hold numerous challenges for you and for our state. But the years ahead will also be full of opportunities. Opportunities for the five of you to help Minnesota remain a shining example for the rest of our nation. To truly be that star of the North, Le Trois de Nord, so colorfully depicted on our state flag. We offer you our support, and we wish you all the best as you endeavor to fulfill the promise of your offices for the good of all Minnesotans. And to all of you, thank you again for your presence here today. As we depart, the Minnesota National Guard 34th Infantry Division Band will be playing and giving us a wonderful musical send-off. Before I close, I'd like to remind everyone, hopefully you know about these, there'll be two parties, one at one o'clock in the vault of the state capitol, Constitutional Officers Ellison, Simon, and Blaha will host a public reception, and then at three o'clock in the rotunda of the capitol, Governor Wallace and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan invite you to attend their public reception, and brief remarks will be given at four o'clock. So carry on, we have much to celebrate. Thank you all for being here, we are officially adjourned. <laughs>